in your Google Drive under uh, Shared With Me. Unfortunately, it does not provide you any kind of an email notice that, that it's there, but um, that's where it'll be. And uh, if you can't find it and want it for whatever reason in the future, just let me know and I'll um, point you in the right direction. So um, this is the sixth session of Google Hangouts Meet. Um, I had offered it up uh, last week and on Friday. It originally offered two sessions and uh, by Friday, um, I think I put the notice out on Wednesday, by Friday we had like 150 people that were signed up for it and I ended up uh, kind of breaking that up into um, a bunch of smaller sessions just to make it a little bit more manageable. Uh, this time we just went for the gusto, we allowed as many people in as wanted to. So I think I've got uh, somewhere around, um, actually let's see here, we've got 96 people uh, signed up for this particular session. So um, I can tell, and you should be able to too, in the upper right hand corner of your screen that there's currently 55 um, people connected. Um, that's a little bit deceiving because I'm actually in the list twice. Uh, the reason I'm in the list twice is once for my video and audio, and then the second time for the fact that I'm sharing my screen. So I actually count in there twice. And if any of you suddenly started sharing your screen, you would show up a second time as well. So we're going to kind of start by um, talking about, let me flip over to the slides. Here they are. We're going to start by talking about um, what is Google Hangouts Meet in the first place. Um, I guess the easiest term that I could use for you right now is to say it's Zoom. That's what everybody thinks of when they think of this type of meeting. Of course, Zoom is a brand name. It's a specific product that um, that they you know are out trying to sell people. Um, it is obviously very popular right now because of everything that's going on. But it uh, Google Hangouts Meet or just Google Meet really is the more proper term now. Um, is essentially the same thing as what Zoom, Skype, Microsoft Teams meeting, um, kind of like FaceTime, although FaceTime is really meant to be more of a, a small group, one-to-one -one kind of a thing. Um, it's a web collaboration tool allowing multiple parties to be on at the same time with video and audio communication. Um, people can present their screens. Um, multiple people can present their screens. It doesn't have to be just one person. Um, it supports any kind of modern device. So if you've got, uh, you know, Windows um, desktop, laptop, tablet, uh, Mac, Chromebook, smartphone, whether it's Android or, or uh, iPhone, it doesn't matter, uh, iPad, all of those types of things all are supported uh, with this, this product and pretty much all the rest as well. Um, I am going to try to call out some of the differences between Zoom and Google Hangouts Meet or Google Meet that, um, that I'm aware of anyway. Um, and we can certainly have a deeper dive discussion on that. Um, it may sound like in some instances that I'm being critical of Zoom, but there'll be other times that I'm going to tell you that Zoom can do something that, that Google can't do. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't intend it to be that way. When you uh, create a, a Google Meet, um, you're given a link that can be used on a computer or tablet or whatever, but you're also given a dial-in phone number and a PIN number associated with your meeting that somebody can use from a landline or just a, you know, a cell phone, whatever, if they're traveling, that they can dial in and participate via audio only. So that's uh, automatically available to you when you create the uh, Google Meet. I'm also going to show you how you can get your own personal PIN number that's associated with the meeting a little bit later. Uh, I already mentioned that both the presenter and the participants can share their screen. So if we were having some kind of a, um, you know, an activity where uh, the students were expected to provide some kind of a presentation, um, either one uh, student at a time or as groups, they would be able to share their screen. Everybody would be able to see that. When they were done, they could stop sharing. The next group could start sharing their screen. And we could do that all in the same meeting. Uh, the meeting can be recorded. Um, I'm recording this meeting, in fact. Um, I've recorded the other sessions as well. So if you weren't able to participate in any of those other sessions, um, whether it's Google Forms, uh, 
Google Drive, Google Basics of or Google Slideshow Basics, uh, any of those types of things, uh, screencasting. Um, you know, just shoot me an email and I'll send you a link to those recordings. It does have built-in closed captioning, um, but what you need to be aware of with that is the closed captioning is personal to you. And what I mean is if I turn on closed captioning, then I will see the captions, but the rest of the audience necessarily won't. If you turn on closed captioning yourself, you'll see your close, the closed captioning. It'll closed caption for all of the audio, not just what you say, but for what anybody says. But um, you might think that the presenter or the owner of the meeting could turn on captions and everybody that's participating would see them. That's not the case. It's something that each individual participant would have to choose to turn on or turn off individually. Now, if I turn mine on, because of the fact that I'm sharing my screen, you will actually start to see the captions on your screen, but that's only because of the fact that I'm sharing my screen with you currently. Um, if I wasn't presenting and sharing my screen with you right now, and if I wasn't sharing specifically my Google Meet screen with you, you wouldn't see the captions at all unless you turned on your own. So you should see the, the captions at the bottom right there. Um, but they're coming from my screen. And you can see it's automatic and it actually does a pretty good job. Um, I would have to read through all of this, but just, you know, glancing at it, I think it's done a pretty good job of, you know, converting my speech to text um, throughout. I'm going to turn that back off. The other thing you need to know about closed captioning, um, and I'll probably reiterate this later, but even as the presenter, if I turn on closed captioning and I record the meeting, the captions are not recorded in the recording. So if you want captions on your recorded copy of your meeting, you still have to figure out how to manually add them separately later. I wish that wasn't the case, but it is what it is. So let me flip back over to my slide here so I don't forget anything. Um, one of the reasons that I'm encouraging people to use Google Meet instead of a product like Zoom is the simple fact that it's already included with our Google Apps for Education suite. Um, Zoom is a commercial product. Um, while they've done a lot because of what's going on right now to um, you know, make their free version more openly available, they took off some of the, the caps on the limitations of the lengths of the meetings and some of those types of things. Eventually, they're going to put those caps back on. And if you want to use their product um, and have multiple rooms and some of the management tools and all those types of things, then there's going to be a cost for it. We already have Google Meet as part of our Google Apps for Education suite, and therefore, we might as well use what we've got. Uh, in Google Hangouts Meet, you can have up to 250 uh, participants in your meeting. And I list here at the bottom that it's HIPAA compliant and FERPA compliant. Um, that's sort of a, you know, it kind of is, kind of isn't kind of a thing. By saying that it's HIPAA compliant, um, in our Google domain settings, there's an area that I can check some boxes and basically accept some conditions that, um, that basically says that um, it makes some of their products HIPAA compliant. Really, with, when it comes to HIPAA compliancy, it's more about what you're sharing in the meeting, who's in the meeting, whether they are legally, um, you know, have the right to hear or see that information. So you still have to be very careful about any of the, the sharing of any kind of medical records. Um, and then FERPA is the same kind of concept as, as it relates to student record type of information. All right, so we're going to just uh, kind of go around the edges of the screen here and talk about the various components that you see when you're in a Google Hangouts Meet. In the upper left, yeah, go ahead. I just put a message in or a chat. I have a student that's hearing impaired. If my interpreter was part of the meet, could she be seen at all times? So then, then. I wouldn't need closed captioning anyway. Yeah, they could they could turn on closed captioning if they wanted to, but um, especially if it's in a small group setting, like it's maybe the interpreter, you, and the student, because it would just be those few windows, 
Um, by default, all three of those windows would be visible anyway. Um, and I'm going to show you in a little bit how you can change sort of the layout of your screen um, to some degree. But when you're in small group sessions, one on one, you'll always see just the other person, you know, one and uh, one to two or one to three kind of situations. You'll pretty much always see the other people's videos at the same time. The other thing you can do, and, and I'll, I'll refer back to this again in a little bit, but you can also use the pin feature so they could um, find the video of the interpreter, whether it's a video window they can see currently or from the people list, and they could click on that pin and that would lock that video on that screen for them. So even if they were in a bigger group session, it wouldn't be constantly flipping video back and forth based on who was talking and you know them losing track of you know where the interpreter's at. That because that, would, the, that yeah. would I don't know, it seems like that would kind of help all of our situations, but we don't always have an interpreter available. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Definitely. Okay. Um, so in the upper left hand corner of the screen, we've got the um, indication that it's currently recording, that I'm currently presenting. If I had stopped presenting, it doesn't mean that I'm stopped showing my video. It just means I'm stopped sharing my screen. So that would change up there. If we move over into the upper right corner of the screen, I can see something that you probably don't have access to right now. And that's this extra little button here. It looks like a grid and it's currently got a slash through it. That's an actual uh, Chrome extension that I've added into my um, computer. And let me look real quick. I think that I added a slide about where you can get that extension, but let me double check. Yep, I did. So slide 12, if you've got access to the slide deck for later on, is where I talk about that. What that does is it allows you to get sort of the Brady Bunch type view, um, where you can see all of the video windows all at the same time. So if you've got 30 people in your meeting, you'll see all 30 people at the same time. Let me turn mine on right now. It might be a little overwhelming for you to all look at. And it looks like most people maybe have their video muted. So I'm only seeing the four right now, but um, I was in a meeting the other day and I literally probably had 45, 50 individual video windows all showing at the same time. So I could see every single person that had their camera turned on showing up there on the screen. So that is an extension though that you have to install if you wanna use that. Uh, next to that is my list of people. So I can see that I've got at least one dial-in caller here. Um, I can see the phone number of that person. I can then also see every one of the individuals. Now, some of the things I can do from this list, if somebody was um, maybe making a bunch of background noise and they either didn't know how to mute or they had walked away from their desk and were hearing phones ringing and all that kind of stuff in the background and it's just being very distracting to the meeting, let's just say that it's Alyssa that's, that that is who is occurring with, I could pop that down and as the owner of the meeting, I could click on the mute button under her name and it would mute her um, outbound audio, her microphone would be muted. And so we would stop hearing her. Um, I cannot unmute somebody. Um, the only person that can unmute a person is the person themselves. And that's really for privacy purposes, right? Um, if I could go in and unmute any of you and you're having a private sidebar conversation, suddenly everybody in the meeting potentially would be hearing that. So I can mute somebody as the owner of the meeting, but I cannot unmute them. So if they're struggling with how do I unmute, you may have to you know, specifically say, move your mouse down to the bottom, look for the microphone icon, click it to you know, unmute yourself. I can also, on that same area, I'll pick on uh, Alyssa this time, I could um, remove the person completely from the meeting. So that actually would disconnect them completely. If you get somebody that connects in, they decide they're going to be belligerent, they're you know refusing to um, mute themselves. Um, you get one of these situations, you've probably heard the term now called Zoom bombing, where somebody just randomly pops into your meeting. They could be anywhere in the world, and they just sort of guessed what your meeting number was. 
and um, you know you've heard probably some pretty nasty things that they've decided to say and and show on their screens and so forth. Um, that would be a way that as the owner of the meeting, I could just simply go to their um, screen and remove them from the meeting. If they've been invited to the meeting, like I sent all of you a calendar invite, if you use your calendar invite to join, I didn't have to invite or I didn't have to admit you individually. There was a few people that I did have to admit, probably because they used a different email address to connect than what the calendar invite came from or because they used a non-Google address to connect. So anybody that you've invited to the meeting through a calendar invite, they come in automatically. The result of that is if I remove that person, there's nothing that stops them from coming right back in again. Now with the Zoom bombing concept, they just guessed at the meeting number in the first place or the URL to your meeting. And so they would have had to specifically be admitted so when they get disconnected, if they tried to come right back in again, you would just have to make sure that you didn't admit them the second time. Otherwise, they'll probably go right back to doing the same thing again. So that is a concern. Um, you know, you've probably heard some fairly high profile things that have happened with that kind of a thing. Um, but, you know, hopefully it's, it's not going to happen um, on any regular basis. So that's how uh, we can control that. Um, I can also pin directly from the uh, people screen. So if I wanted to pin Andrea's uh, video, if it was turned on, I could do that. That's kind of like uh, the answer that I had to Janelle's question earlier. Um, if you can see their video screen, you can also put your mouse right on top of their video screen and use the pin or the mute right there on their video screen to do the same two concepts, okay? Also from the people menu, we can manually add somebody. So if we realize, um, you know, hey, we forgot, we need this very imp important person to come join our meeting, we can right here put in their email address. If we pick them and e that or just type it in, we could send them an invite right now. We would probably want to follow that up with the phone call to say, hey, check your email real quick and connect into our meeting, please. We can also go to this call tab and type in their phone number and what the, the system will do is within a couple of seconds, Google will place a phone call to that person. It'll just come up as a um, kind of random looking number because it's gonna be one of Google's numbers. Um, and when, if they answer the phone, it'll say something like, you know, press one to, to join the meeting now. They just press one and they're in. Now, of course, that would be an audio only kind of a situation. So if you want them to be able to see your video or share, you know, files with you or whatever, um, you'll probably want to maybe do both. Send them the phone invite so that they at least jump on right away. Send them the meeting invite so that when they can, they can jump on via computer or tablet or smartphone or whatever and join you that way as well. So that's add people. Um, also in the upper right, we have our chat button. So the little call out, and I can see there's three chat items there that I haven't seen yet. So Courtney's asking, for example, what is that extension called to add it to our meet? Um, let's see what that extension is called. It is called the Google Meet Grid View. So I'll copy and paste that in there as well. Um, and yes, to uh, Echo's question, will we be uh, showing how to make a calendar invite? Uh, yes, towards the end, we're going to show you how to do that. So you can see how the chat works. Um, a couple of caveats about the chat. One is that there is not a private chat option. So I can't specifically send Deb Fuller a direct chat message that nobody else can see. Um, and any chat message that's put in to the chat uh, window cannot be removed. So if somebody puts something in there that's not so nice, they can't remove it, nor can the meeting owner. Once it's there, it's there. 
So that's something to also be aware of. Um, it does list specifically who put it in and when they put it in. So if any kind of disciplinary action would be necessary down the road, uh, you would have documentation of that. And actually also because of the fact that I'm recording this meeting, when the uh, recording is finished, not only will I get the video of what's been shared, but I'll also get a uh, basically a Google Doc that is a blog of what happened in the chat. So it'll list each person, what they said, when they said it. Um, it'll be basically just like what you see in this chat list here. And I'll show you one of those when we're done as well. So that's the upper right. Um, if we go down into the lower left part of the screen, you see the Google Hangouts Meet uh, training. So that was the name of my meeting. And if I hit the up arrow, you can see that I was able to share out with you a direct link to the slides for today's presentation. And I also attached a PDF copy of those slides. Now, here's what you need to know. I really just attached the PDF just so you could see how an attachment shows up. Um, the slides have been updated, whereas the PDF was not. So if you're going to look at one or the other, look at the slides. Don't necessarily look at the PDF. It's The PDF's mostly complete. It's just missing probably you know a few things that I've added sort of after the fact as I've gone through more and more of these sessions. But um, the Google slide link is a, a live link. Any changes that are made to the slide presentation automatically change um, for you as well. The key point that I want to point out here is a couple of things. One is if you know suddenly you realize that you wanted to invite somebody else, um, you could go down here and simply copy and paste, you know, the meeting URL and the phone number and send a quick email off to somebody. So any of you could join could do that. Um, and it would get them access um, to at least try to come into the meeting. I would still have to admit them if they tried to connect. But more importantly is the fact that we're able to kind of take all of the resources that we need for this particular meeting and put them all in one place. So not only are we having this discussion and we're sharing video and audio, but our documents related to what we're going to discuss today are all right here in this little um, bottom left corner window. I'm going to show you where that stuff comes from. Um, so if I go back out to my calendar and I go to today's meeting, when I create the meeting, and I'm going to show you this in more detail in a little while, but whatever I put down in this box down here is what will automatically populate into that lower left-hand corner of the meeting window. So if I want to add something else to it, Maybe there's going to be um, some kind of a document. And maybe I just make a new Google Doc real quick. Okay, whatever that is, just grab this um, URL. I got to make sure that everybody has access to it. So I'm going to change this real quick. It actually would ask me if if I wanted to update that when I send you the, um, or when I update the calendar item. But So if I paste that link in there to that Google document and save this, it's going to ask me, hey, do you want to send out an email to every single participant telling them about the change? I really don't want to do that because you don't want to all see that. But if I go back to our meeting information now, Within a pretty short period of time, actually, there it is already. Here's the document as well. There's a link to that document. So by using a calendar invite to create the Google Meet with all of you, I'm able to very quickly add more resources to this meeting if I need to, OK? Um, because of the fact that um, it's tied to my Google Calendar item, if somebody else wanted to add a resource, unfortunately, they're really not able to. There's not a, a direct edit button from down here. But the owner of the meeting can add more resources as they need to. Okay, so we'll come back to that when we get into the uh, more details about the calendar item. So sticking with the stuff across the bottom of the screen, looking at the bottom middle, we've got the ability to um, mute your microphone or unmute, mute, 
mute your microphone, that is related to you personally, right? So if I mute mine, it's only muting me. It's not doing anything to the rest of you. I can leave the call by hanging up. And let me uh, make one comment about leave call, and that is even if, um, even if the owner of the meeting leaves the call, that does not end the meeting. So I could leave right now, and the other 56 of you would still be in the meeting and could still continue talking and, you know, chatting and whatever it is that you want to do. So the other thing to know is that the meeting, there's got to be some time limit. I haven't researched this but the meeting technically is open indefinitely. So as an example, I could go back to the meetings that I had last Friday when I did these other sessions, and I could still open up any one of those meeting rooms, as could anybody else that had gotten those invites, and they could still potentially um, you know, connect in with other people if others did the same thing. I had an email from somebody earlier today saying that they wanted to be able to sort of have an open-ended meet where um, te you know teachers could kind of take turns being in that room and parents would be allowed to just sort of pop into the room or students would be able to allowed to pop into the room um, whenever they had uh, the time and ability to do so and they wanted to know you know how do we do that well you just make a, a meet and share that the link to the meet out with everybody and it essentially stays open forever. I mean, forever is probably not correct. I can look into that, but it stays open for a long period of time anyway. It's not just tied to your calendar. So, you know, if I made a one hour appointment, it's not like at the end of that hour, suddenly the meeting ends and nobody can get into it anymore. Um, it stays uh, open sort of indefinitely, I guess I'll put it that way. To the right of the leave meeting button, I've got the ability to turn my camera on and off. So if you do have a camera available to you um, and you wanted to you know, mute your video essentially, uh, that's what you're able to do. Um, there's been a lot of discussion though. Um, you know, we did a screencasting session earlier today and um, there's, you know, when you create a screencast, a lot of the tools allow you to embed your, um, webcam video of yourself on those um, windows as well. And, you know, teachers have a tendency, and I think just people in general have a tendency not to want people to see their video. But when it comes to student engagement, there's been a lot of discussion about that being very important for them to be able to see you, not just hear you, not just see your mouse moving around, but to be able to see you. So keep that in mind if you're having a meet that involves, you know, students and families and so forth is uh, put on your best pajamas, you know, do your makeup, do your hair, whatever, but turn on that webcam, um, at least from the top up, you know, be cognizant of what's happening behind you. If anybody's walking around, uh, you know, kind of looking a little rough or whatever, but um, just be aware of that. So move into the lower right, uh, turn on captions. Uh, we kind of talked about that already but that's the button where you can toggle the captions on and off and feel free to, to try that out uh, and see how well it works for you. Um, again, you turning it on doesn't impact anybody else. Me turning it on won't impact you. And then to the right of that, mine currently says you are presenting, but yours actually probably says something like present or share your screen, something like that. Um, so if you were to click on that, it would then ask you, do you want to share a window or do you want to share a screen? The difference is this. If you share a window, it's sharing just the one program that you select, like it might be your Chrome window or Microsoft Word, just that one window. If you share your screen, any programs that you have open on that screen will all be shared simultaneously. It's like you're showing off the entire screen that you can see. If you have multiple screens, like I have three screens set up here on the computer that I'm working on now, if I tell it to share my screen, it will ask me which screen I want to share, and it would allow me to pick one, two, or three. Most of the time, I would advise that you share just a window. And when you share that window, I would advise that it be like a Chrome window, because even though this is a single window, that I'm sharing, I can still flip back and forth between the tabs of the window and the people will see each one of those tabs that I've clicked on. So I could flip over to my email and you would see my email. 
I could flip to my Google Drive, you would see my Google Drive. I'm currently sharing my Google Meet window, which normally you would not do. Normally, you're not going to try to share out which the Google Meet because they're already seeing the Google Meet. I'm only sharing it in order to try to train you about Google Meet. Hopefully, that makes sense. That's also why uh, some people have gotten confused in some of the past sessions about um, they would say that they tried to click on the chat button and they weren't able to. I think what was happening is they were clicking on my shared window chat button, not their own chat button, which is probably just a little above that. Because I'm, I'm guessing you're seeing two chat buttons, the one I'm sharing plus your own. So you would just have to click on your chat button um, up above. If we go down to the lower right, we've got this set of more options, these three little dots. So this menu will vary a little bit based on some of your computer capabilities or your tablet or whatever device you're on. Um, it'll also vary a little bit based on how you're connected to the meeting. So at the very top, there is the ability to start and stop recording. Now, before anybody clicks on that, I have to warn you that that is a global setting. So if any of you stop the meeting or stop the recording, I should say, it stops the recording for everybody. So please don't click on stop recording right now. Um, the reason for that is because no matter who starts the recording, there's only one recording and it gets shared out to everybody after the meeting is done. So there's no reason for each of us individually to need to record the meeting in the first place because um, that one recording is available to everybody. Below there, um, oh, one other thing I'm going to mention about the recording. The only time you won't see start or stop recording is if you did not get a direct calendar invite to the meeting. So if I had just emailed you just like this URL up here, I sent that to you via email, and when you connected, you specifically had to wait for me to allow you into the meeting. In that case, you would not have the ability to start or stop the recording. But anybody that you invite through like a calendar invite will have that, that uh, option to turn that on or off. Um, I think I already mentioned, but even if you have closed captioning turned on, the recording does not include those captions. The next thing that you see there is change layout. If I click on change layout, I'll see that there's really three, kind of four, I guess, if you include auto. But there's a few different ways that I can um, have my screen laid out so I can see a few more windows over here to the right. But remember also, if you install that uh, plugin that um, we talked about a little earlier, I think it was in this session that we talked about it, didn't we? Well, maybe um, it is shared in the slides anyway, where you can do the kind of Brady Bunch type view like this, where we can see all kinds of uh, people all at the same time. So that's the um, extra extension that would have to be uh, installed and, and turned on if you wanted to, um, to do that. So let me go back to change layout here again, and we'll just go back to this layout. We can also go to full screen and full screen is just, you know, get rid of your taskbar and your uh, tabs and that kind of stuff at the, the bottom of the screen. Um, if you want to get out of full screen, you can either double click with your mouse or just hit the escape key. If I go back to that menu, you may or may not have the choice to switch camera. So switch camera will appear if you have more than one camera available to you. So if you're on a smartphone or an iPad, you probably have like a front facing and a rear facing camera, you know, the selfie cam and the, the regular camera. So that would allow you to flip back and forth between the front and the rear. I have two cameras um, because I've got a webcam that's just USB connected and then my laptop has a built in webcam. So that's why I have this choice showing up here. Turn on captions is the same thing as this button down here. Settings is an important menu for you as a presenter of a, um, of a Google Meet to be aware of. If people are having audio problems, um, have them go down to the three dots, click on settings, 
and then have them take a look at their microphone and speaker settings. It may be that if they click on microphone, they might have multiple choices for their microphone like I do, and it may be that they're just on the wrong one. It might be that they're on one that works, but it's a lot further away from them. Like one of the microphones that's showing up in my list here is actually my webcam microphone that's probably three or four feet away from me versus my USB you know, headset mic that's right here by my face. So they can simply toggle back and forth between these different choices when they um, pick an alternate choice, have them just talk and see if they get the little indicator here, you know, suggesting that it's hearing them real well. They can also test their speakers. Maybe it's playing out of their desktop speakers and they want to switch it to their headset. You know, those choices are all there. And then on the video tab, this is where they could also pick between their uh, cameras and they can also pick the resolution that they want to send out to the rest of the world, as well as the resolution that they want to receive from the rest of the world. Of course, human nature is let's max those out. Let's put them on 720p or whatever your highest setting is. But just be aware that, you know, as all of us are dealing with um, both staff and students that live in remote areas that have very poor internet access, um, you know, maybe they're just sitting in the McDonald's parking lot working off a of Wi-Fi or whatever. Um, if you start jacking all of those up to the highest possible resolutions, you might start to get some pixelation. You might start to get some audio choppiness. We'd much rather have good audio, even if we can't see anybody, um, than to, you know, just try to have the maximum resolution on everybody's camera. I've actually been in some Zoom meetings where, um, and Zoom's view by default is this type of a thing where you see everybody. I've been in some Zoom meetings where some of the participants have asked people, hey, will you all mute your cameras because my audio is, is chopping out because of all of the bandwidth that it takes in order to see all of that video at the same time. So just be aware of that, that, um, you know, is what you're That, that you should let things catch up. Okay, there we go. Um, and then last but not least of the things we're going to talk about on this menu in the lower right hand corner is use a phone for audio. Now you might say, isn't that the same thing as when we went up here to the people menu and we said, add people, and we said call, and had it call them. And isn't that the same thing as this stuff down here where it's got a dial-in phone number? And isn't that the same as the phone number and the PIN that's in the calendar invite that went out? Well, not really. Um, this call me, if you have it dial you from here, will cause your... Um, phone to show up in the list still with your name specifically associated with it. Whereas if we add the person through this method and call them, it's just going to show up with the, with whatever their phone number is. It'll mask part of it so everybody doesn't see their, their personal phone number. Um, and if the person dials in with this phone number and this PIN, this is the same as what was in the calendar invite. They will also just show up in the meeting list as their phone number. So you may not necessarily recognize who the person is, especially if it's more of a public meeting. If the person, though, joins first with the computer and then they specifically go and say, use a phone for audio and they have it call them or they use this dial in number and this pin, that pin is unique to that person. So you might say, if they're on a computer, why would they dial in at all? Why would they use a phone? Well, a lot of people that have desktop computers don't have a microphone and don't have a webcam. And so they might be able to see what's going on and they might be able to hear everything through their speakers, but they don't have a way to talk back and for people to see them. 
So they could connect with their computer first so they can see the video part, whatever's being shared. They could then come down here and say, use a phone for audio. And then they could use their own personal dial-in number and PIN. And they would show up in the meeting list twice. One would be their audio-only call. The other one would be their computer connection. So not a real big deal, but that's the difference. And I just want to point out, if you take a close look at this, Look at this pin, starts with 714. For the exact same meeting, this pin started with 408 or 480, I guess it was. So they are different pins. One's associated with you personally. The other one's associated just generically with the, the meeting itself. Okay. Um, so I think that concludes kind of the layout of the screen discussion. Um, let me make sure I didn't miss anything here. Okay, I talked about the grid view, so the, the Chrome extension um, that allows you to do kind of the Brady Bunch type of a thing. Um, I'll paste that into the chat window here too. I think I did that in the earlier session, but not in this one. I could be wrong. These sessions are all running together. Uh, let's go back to the slides. Um, so we talked about uh, recording a meeting a little bit. Um, you know, I talked about the fact that the uh, closed captioning is not recorded as part of it. Um, so the owner of the meeting, when the meeting is done, will get an email that tells them that the recording is finished. And let me find one of those emails for you real quick here so you can see what it looks like. So here's one right here. Let me open this up. So this is from one of the uh, sessions that I did yesterday. Um, so we recorded the session. Um, it took a little while after the session was finished, but then Google sent me an email telling me that the, re the recording of the meeting and the chat transcript are now available. It gives me a direct link to open it up if I want to, or I can open it up in my Google Drive. What it does is, It'll create a folder for you in your Google Drive called Meet Recordings. If you've never recorded a meeting before, it'll automatically create the folder for you. So if I go in my Google Drive here and I go to Meet Recordings, it automatically has placed every one of these recorded meetings for me into this folder. So there's ones I've done you know, the past several days. Um, they're all there. It also then puts that chat transcript as a document in that same folder. So if I open this up, you can see this was the chat, chat transcript from the Google Drive and sharing permission session um, yesterday, okay? So there is that. Unfortunately, it does not automatically email the participants of the meeting anything to tell them that the recording is there um, or how to get to it. But it does automatically share the recording with all of the participants. So what I'm doing is I'm right clicking on one of these videos. I'm going to share. I'm going to advanced and I can see Stacy Reno, Ta Tanya, Priscilla. I can see all of these people were in that session and it automatically shared view only access to the um, recording file with them. It also gave them read-only access to the chat transcript file. If they went into their Google Drive and inside of their Google Drive, they went to the shared with me folder, they would be, be able to then look for this Google Drive and sharing video and they would be able to play it from there. Probably the best thing you can do as the facilitator of the meeting would be to, um, when that's done, just go and grab that link and maybe send, blast out an email to everybody saying, hey, if you want a, a copy of the meeting uh, recording, here it is. 
since it doesn't automatically go to them. If I wanted to share it with people that weren't able to attend the meeting, then I would just go to that same file. I would go to share and I would add more people to the share list. And in that case, those people actually would get uh, an email telling them that it's been shared with them because of the fact that I'm manually doing the share process at that time. So that's what happens with the um, meeting recording. Now, what could I do with that meeting recording? I could share it out from my Google Drive. I could upload it to my YouTube channel. Once I upload it to my YouTube channel, YouTube has some facilities that are free that can allow you to add closed captioning to the recording. So I could then use YouTube's closed captioning capabilities to add the closed captions back to my recording that unfortunately Google didn't automatically record for me. So um, I talked in our last session about ADA compliance issue, Americans with Disabilities Act, um, anything that you post on your website, um, anything that you share with students, parents, whatever, you, you really need to be very careful with, um, whether it's a, a video recording to make sure that it's got closed captioning, if it's some other ki kind of uh, even hard copy document to make sure that whatever kind of um, disabilities they may have, that um, they're able to access, you know, those recordings, those, um, they're able to read the documents appropriately and so forth. So we had a discussion obviously earlier in this session about uh, maybe having a, a signer, um, you know, show up in one of the video windows for um, somebody that's hearing impaired. Um, actually, one of our, um, one of our itinerant staff yesterday was talking about the fact that, um, you know, the closed captioning doesn't necessarily work with um, some of the, the parents and students because they're not good readers. Um, so we can have all the captions we want, but if they're not able to read it, that doesn't do them any good either. So having that signer may be something that's, you know, helpful in those particular cases. So all things that you've got to be aware of um, and think about um, when you're putting out not just this type of video, but any video that you're posting to um, your website, your YouTube channel, any of those types of things. Okay. Other things about recording the meeting. Let's see. Um, when you first turn on recording, it does give you a prompt to um, suggest to you that you should ask for consent from all of the people that are participating in the meeting, um, you know, to make sure that they're all willing to allow you to record them. Um, I told you that I was recording this meeting, but I didn't necessarily ask for your consent, so sorry about that. Uh, I talked about this stuff already. Okay, so I talked about all the rest of that already. So now on to how do you make one of these meetings in the first place? So I showed you um, already a little bit about um, how I edited my calendar appointment to put this extra stuff in down here. So the preferred method to create a Google Meet is definitely through your calendar. How do you get to your calendar? Well, if you know how to get to your email, just go up to the Google Apps button, which is the nine little dots on the upper right, go to calendar, Everybody that's got a Google uh, Mail account also has a calendar, even if you've never used it. Inside of your calendar then, it might show as a week view like mine is. It might show as a day view where you're just seeing today's appointments. It could show as a month. You can toggle back and forth between those. But what I suggest you do is you find the day and the time that you want the um, meet to occur. So maybe I want to have it at 6 o'clock. I can just click in that box that I accidentally clicked on 6.30, no problem, I can adjust that. And maybe I'm gonna have a um, IEP review meeting. Let's just use that as an example. I give it the name. There's a lot more details really that I wanna add to this though. So I'm gonna hit more options. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, oops, I screwed up, I didn't mean 6.30, I'm at six. Maybe seven o'clock is fine. Maybe it's only going to be a half an hour. So I can adjust those things. Remember what I said earlier, though, is your it does not suddenly cut you off at 630 or at seven or whatever time. The meeting stays open indefinitely anyway. But it's, it's a good uh, practice to set that appropriately so your calendar and the people that you're inviting can make sure that they've got time. 
The key thing is this right here, add conferencing. If I click on that, I can say Hangouts Meet, tells me up to 250 participants, and it automatically creates the web address to get to the meeting. And if I want to see the further details, it automatically creates the dial-in phone number and PIN number for that meeting. There's also a capability that um, Google has turned on temporarily for uh, everybody, and that's the ability to do a live stream. Um, I don't really have anything in this session to talk about that, but a live stream is really a one-way outbound broadcast of the, um, of the meeting. Um, you know, if you're going to have a, a larger audience, maybe than 250, maybe you're going to have a board meeting or something like that. Uh, key things to think about if you're going to do that one-way broadcast is, especially with the board meeting, you need to be able to provide public participation. So you still need to make sure that they have some kind of a dial-in number or other way of connecting in during that time of the meeting so that they can have their say. So that's that, but primarily it's the stuff right here that you're worried about. I talked already about if you want to add additional content to the meeting, you can add whatever you want down here and it'll show up in that lower left-hand window. I can also attach a file, either something that's already in my Google Drive or I can go and upload a file from my computer. So maybe I've got some kind of a PDF file that um, I want to share out with everybody. It's going to upload that. And then here is where I would add my guests. Now, if I just want to play around with this, I don't have to add anybody. I could save it, and then I could come right back in here to that appointment that I just added and I could join my Hangouts Meet and I could be in there all by myself and just kind of play around with the tools. You can make as many of these as you want. You can, like I said, use the same one over and over again. You can invite your spouse to join in on another device if you want to practice with it, and play around with it, invite your kids, invite family members, and this could be your, you know, remote way of having your Easter celebration together or whatever. Um, any of that kind of stuff can happen. Normally, though, if I'm going to invite a group like all of you today, I would want to add guests. So I could put in specific email addresses. I want to add Deb in there. Um, I could add whoever I wanted to. And they can be um, people that have Google accounts, but they could also be people that have Yahoo or any other kind of email accounts. Um, if somebody doesn't have an email address whatsoever, you would just have to have some way of giving them this link. So it could be posted on Facebook. It could be posted, you know, on Twitter. It could be posted on your website. Um, you know, Facebook and Twitter generally require an email account, but your, your website wouldn't necessarily require an email account for somebody to get to that link if you posted it there. I can also paste in a bunch of addresses. So like with these trainings, you know, I had lots and lots of people sign up. So I could just come into my spreadsheet here and I could say, oh, I want to invite all these people. I could just copy, go back over to my calendar item. And I've got it open somewhere. There it is. And I could paste. And all of those addresses would show up in there. If I hit set, uh, save, it'll then want to send invites to all of those people. It'll also verify that I'm willing to um, have external people included, meaning people that are not part of my organization. And it'll also make sure that it's given permission to this document that I've attached. So it'll ask me all those questions and I'll just basically say yes, 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 kind of a thing throughout. I'm not going to go and invite all these people because they'll wonder what the heck this is all for. So I'm just going to go back out of that. So that's how you would um, create a new um, Google Meet. That's the recommended method anyway, is doing it through your calendar. A uh, second choice is you can literally just start a new browser tab and go to meet.google.com. And it'll give you an option to join or start a meeting. It asks you if you want to give the meeting a nickname. The nickname is optional. And the nicknames, if you share it with somebody else, only works with people within your same organization. So I usually, I don't do it this way anyway, but um, this is technically not necessary. And then it would be, do I want my camera on or off? Do I want my audio on or off? And then I would just say, join now. 
Now this method um, would be for a meeting that I want to have pretty much right here and now, because here's the connection stuff. And if I want to invite anybody else, I would then have to manually copy and paste the stuff out to an email to them or from within the meeting, once I've connected to it, I could go up like I showed you earlier on the people list and manually add them up here. So that's the second way that you can start a, a Google Meet. The last way that I'm going to show you is from your Google Apps button. So if I'm in Google Drive or if I'm in my email, I can go to my Google Apps button and I can scroll down a little bit here and there is Meet. If I click on that, it's basically the same thing as what I just showed you by just manually going to meet.google.com. Okay. So those are the three ways we're going to talk about of how to create a new Google Meet. Um, and then it's just a matter of, you know, if you do it through the calendar invite, everybody hopefully will receive that invitation in their email and understand how to join it um, after the fact or once, once it's time to do so. Um, so there's a question from Sherry. Can a, a meeting be set to happen at a specific time every week? If so, will an email be sent to invited guests each time? So let's see if we make a recurring calendar appointment. So let me add a new one here. Um, we'll call it a recurring meet. How about that? And I'm going to go into more options. And I'm going to say that it repeats uh, weekly on Wednesday at 630. And let's add our Hangouts meet to it. And I'm just going to save this. Okay, what I'm going to look at is I want to see if the meeting address is the same every single time, just out of curiosity. So I'm going to copy this and just um, paste it into my Google Doc here so that we've got it for reference. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to go to next Wednesday. And here's my next Wednesday appointment. And... Here's my Google Hangouts Meet. Let's see if this is exactly the same address. Oops, wrong one. And there it is. It did, in fact, make the exact same um, Google Meet um, URL or address uh, for that recurring appointment. So it kind of goes back to what I was talking about before, that it seems to be once you create one of those, they just kind of sit there available indefinitely. So it's probably that same concept. Um, Carmen's asking, could we go into Skyward and highlight a class list so they could all be invited? So as long as in Skyward, you're able to see all their email addresses in such a way that you can select and copy them all at the same time, then yes, you could copy all those email addresses and then simply go into your calendar invite and right here where it says add guest, you would just right click and say paste and then save it and all of them would receive that calendar invite. So good questions. Um, let me jump back to my slides. We're pretty much out of time, but I want to make sure I covered everything here. So that's just another method. Um, whiteboarding app example. So this is just the concept that, um, you know, one of the screens that you might want to share with uh, one of the students or a group of students might be, you know, if you want to work out some kind of a problem, it's kind of the Khan Academy kind of a thing where you want to be doing some whiteboarding and, you know, X plus two equals whatever, that kind of a thing. So just realize that as long as you're able to share your screen, you could use this type of a whiteboarding activity to um, have the student be able to see um, that kind of a screen as well. Um, another use for this is the whole concept of you just creating a meet and inviting nobody else, but you using it as a way to do a screencast. So you create a meet, it's only you, you go in, you turn on recording, and then you go through and demonstrate, talk about, show, whatever it is that you want that lesson to be about. When you're done, stop the recording. And then when the recording is ready, share it and email a link to that recording or put it on your plan book or put it on your you know Google Classroom or put it wherever it is that you can reach all of your students. Um, that would be a way of essentially using Google Meet 
as a screencasting type of a tool. Okay, so that whiteboarding app that uh, I was just showing you is is one way of doing that exact type of a thing. Okay, um, so that is it. So we're up to um, just question time. So um, if anybody has any specific questions and wants to, you know, feel free to unmute your microphone and, and ask away. Um, thankfully, this is my last session, so I get all the time in the in the world to talk. I don't have to jump off and jump right onto another one. So, um, any questions? Uh, Lori asked if she could text someone the link in the chat. Um, yes, you could. I mean, you're going to have to sort of type that whole thing out or figure out some other way to to paste it into a text window. But yes, you could. Bob? Yeah. Uh, this is Carmen. So as a presenter, you are the one that automatically has the button to record things. Or I yes. Uh, as the presenter, you have the, the ability to start and stop the recording, but also anybody else that you've specifically invited through the calendar invite can also stop the recording. So I don't know if you remember when we were talking about that, I specifically said, please don't click on stop recording because even though I'm the owner and presenter right now, if you went in, you could click on stop recording and it would stop recording the entire thing. Um, we I didn't realize that until the first time that we tried this and um, somebody clicked on stop recording. It's like, oh, just stop for everybody. So, so it okay. is something to be aware of. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else? So we got some questions in the chat here. Let's see. If I record, will the student fo photos be recorded too? So it depends on what you're recording, right? So um, if I um, was to go into present and I picked a window, and then let's just say that I picked this window, and I changed my um, I changed my layout so that my layout was just what's called spotlight, which is just one big window only. Um, I wouldn't get any kind of recording of the other video participants. Um, now, if anybody else talked, I guess I'd be curious to see what happened with that, but um, they could also mute their, their video potentially. Um, so I think you'll have to experiment with that a little bit, but I think with those things in mind, that you could share another window, one that's not your Google Meet recording window or your Google Meet window itself, and um, change your uh, layout to the spotlight layout, um, I think that you would end up not recording anybody else's uh, video. Let's see. Okay, so Lyle saying his stop recording is grayed out. So that's interesting. It was a little different than what we experienced the other day. Uh, there's a question about, is there a way to keep track of who is in attendance at a meeting? Um, I guess the only real way to tell that would be a couple of things. One is, you know, you can look at the people list. Uh, the people list, though, is not recorded as part of your recording. Uh, the other thing you could ask everybody that joins to do is to put some kind of a message in the chat window. And then uh, once you get the uh, chat log after the meeting is done and you've stopped the recording, um, every one of the people that had put something in the chat um, would show up in that log and you would at least have some record that, you, that, that they joined the meeting from that standpoint. And if you are trying to figure out how long they stayed in the meeting, I guess you could ask them at the end to put something else in the chat log and kind of work it that way, I suppose, to see, you know, you started with 50 and you ended with 20 or whatever kind of a thing. But um, that's the only way that really comes to mind to me um, to, to do that. The other thing you could do, um, though, is if since you've got um, the ability to have this kind of um, full video window, um, you know, with that plugin that I was talking about, 
um, you could activate that and record that particular view. And I suppose in that case, then you would have a little bit of a, a video version of, um, um, you know, seeing all the, the students. But that also assumes that they've all got a, you know, webcam and that they were all willing to unmute their webcam and all that kind of a thing. So, um, so you should all be able to see here in just a second. So you see how you can see everybody now and not just the three or four. Um, obviously, a lot of people, as we're getting to the end here, have dropped off. Um, earlier, I had, you know, a lot more windows showing up there. And I can choose um, to turn that on and off. I can choose to highlight this, whoever's speaking. I can choose to include myself or not include myself. I can choose to only show participants that have video. If I uncheck that, then every single person that's um, on the call, even if they're on, a, on the phone or they've muted their video, you can see now how we're seeing all of their sort of um, their Google profile pictures or if they don't have one, just like their, you know, letter inside of a circle. So all of this stuff is coming from that um, uh, Chrome plugin that um, I shared with you both through the chat as well as on one of the slides in the uh, presentation. Uh, let's see what else we've got here. Yeah, so the students that call in, um, you know, you, I guess from this view, if you were recording it, you would still see a partial version of their phone number show up. Um, it does mask part of their phone number so that everybody that's in the meeting doesn't see everybody else's phone number. Um, so I don't know if you noticed that earlier when I had the people list up, there was somebody that had dialed in and it showed like the first five digits and the last two digits with little asterisks in between. Um, so if you ask them to speak um, and you're recording the meeting, whatever they say is also going to be, you know, part of that recording as well. So um, I guess that's about all I can tell you as far as that goes. Okay, I'm hoping that I've hit um, most of the questions or all of the questions in here. And again, if anybody has any more, feel free to unmute and ask away. Okay. So with that, I'm going to thank uh, all of you for participating. Uh, again, um, within probably 30 minutes of this, if you were to go into your Google Drive and go to Shared With Me, you would see the uh, recording show up there as well as a copy of the uh, transcript. Um, uh, Joan asked, can they mute their phone or contribute to the discussion? So if somebody dials in, even with the landline, um, when they first dial in, and I forgot to mention this, a good point, when they first dial in, it'll actually tell them, the automated system will tell them that they were they are automatically muted and that they would dial star six to unmute themselves. So star six will allow them then to join the conversation by phone um, with them actively speaking. They'll hear the conversation anyway. And star six is what they would use to remute themselves. So they can mute themselves or through the people list, the owner of the meeting can mute, um, you know, even a call in person. So um, they also, if they've got a smartphone, you know, they can dial in and they can mute themselves with the mute button on their phone. But what they have to be aware of is even if they unmute themselves, if they've never pressed star six, as far as Google Meets is concerned, they're still muted. So they could be sitting there talking away and nobody would hear them, um, even though they, you know, their smartphone looked like it was unmuted. You would still see the little mute button, the little red circle uh, next to their audio. So star six is something important for those that are dial-in users to be aware of. But again, it does tell them that when they first call in. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for participating. I'm going to stop the um, recording and um, we'll see you all again sometime. I hope everybody stays safe and healthy.